Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, The Art of Perfect Playback and Lighting Design presented by Michael Keller. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. Just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a Q&A function where you can submit your questions to the presenter and he'll try to answer as many questions as possible at the end. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. And we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop series that can be found on pro.harman.com. We are adding new sessions weekly, so watch for those on the calendar. And now I'd like to introduce you to Michael Keller, the presenter for today's webinar. Michael yeah. is a touring lighting director, designer, programmer, and technician. Throughout his career, he has worked with a variety of touring acts, including Tina Turner, Lionel Richie, Paul McCartney, Michael Jackson, Janet Jackson, Black Sabbath, Ozzy Osbourne, and more. I would also like to introduce you to my colleague, Brad Schiller, the co-presenter for today's webinar. Brad has been involved in automated lighting for over 30 years and is currently a business development manager at Martin Professional. He is the author of the newly released Living the Lighting Life and the Automated Lighting Programmer's Handbook, as well as a regular columnist for PLSN. A self-described lighting geek, Brad enjoys sharing knowledge with others. And now I'm gonna pass it over to you, Michael. Uh, hello there, I'm, I'm very honored to be here with you. It's, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, let's head into it and let's talk to, with Brad then also, Bradley. Good morning. Hi, Michael. So, and hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, this is going to be a great presentation. Today, I'm going to be uh, interviewing Michael along the way, and we're going to be talking with him about his wonderful career and uh, specifically about how he plays back lighting for various concerts and how he, that influences the design and the technology that goes into it. Because the playback of a concert is really important and getting good timing and hitting the buttons at the same time of the music and making it all look good is a skill that is very much acquired that Michael has mastered over the years. He in fact won the Parnelli Award being a lighting director uh, back in 2016 because he's, he's amazing. And I've had the, the pleasure of seeing him work many different types of shows and he, his timing is extraordinary. So hopefully throughout this session, you're gonna be able to learn uh, a little bit, of, little bit of what makes him so awesome and, uh, and hear some funny stories and, and learn all about Michael and how he uses uh, timing to enhance the various shows. So Michael, how did you get started in lighting? Where did you begin? Uh, well, lighting uh, and color has always been part of my history. When I was a small child, I had colored lighting in my bedroom and I was aware, uh, made aware how it changes your mood and atmosphere. And throughout the high school and every. I had lighting, we had a liquid light show and uh, I made par cans out of coffee cans and just had a little lighting company. And that was, it's always been part of my life. Very cool. And, and early on, didn't you work with Bill Graham and how did that tie into Well, the That's my first professional part of my career. I worked with uh, FM Productions, which was Bill's production uh, company. Um, I started there basically just doing labor work and um, it evolved into, into lighting. I started working at Winterland and became the house LD there. Cool. And, and what acts did you work with there and how did you kind of? Oh, uh, they were, well, with Winterland, uh, it was Bill's premier venue in the Bay Area. So we went through every every type of band possible the last waltz was shot there the martin and um and every week we we'd have so many different types of acts coming through and a lot of the bay area bands that was there basically their home venue also so it, it was quite interesting um i saw the sex pistols there peter frampton the who i mean it's just after a while it, it was a it was a pretty amazing experience. It was a great time to grow up in, 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 that, in, in the industry. It seems like it exposed you to a lot of different bands, which is really great. Um, do, do you play me, any musical instruments? Does that influence you? Do, have you done anything in that sense? I do not. I, uh, when I was a, a youngster in, in uh, 
elementary school, I did try to take up guitar and that didn't really act out very well. I went into the music store and they asked me which one I wanted. And I said, hey, the one with the most pickups, you know, and then that that didn't pan out very well. And then I tried my um, luck at singing and that definitely did not pan out well. So, so I, I stuck with my passion of lighting. But that's probably a good thing. I can't imagine you singing. No offense, but <laughs> <laughs> can't imagine that. Um, who, who are some people who have been influential in your career and why have they been so influential along the way? Well, I've been very um, lucky and blessed to, to work with some of the industry's greats. Um, Peter Morris, Patrick Woodruff, uh, Terry Cook, who works with Patrick, Baz, uh, Mark Brickman, and... Uh, each person, each of these designers have unique styles and you learn basically different things. They, um, they all have their great eye and uh, they're able to achieve uh, their looks. And, and it's, it's interesting to hit, see and feel how each of uh, the designers uh, achieve their end goal of what they want to present to the audience. Okay. Um, and, you know, you've been involved in concert lighting for a long time. How have you seen it other than the technology, which obviously has changed? How have you seen concert lighting change over the years? And how have the designs and queuing in particular changed? Has, has it gotten easier or harder, the queuing and the playback? How has that changed? Well, in the, in the beginning, it was more just about illumination. When I started at Winterland, we had... Uh, the old lustral dimmers where you had took a two by four and ran four or six dimmers at a time to do, and a blackout took five seconds. So yeah, it, it's changed quite a bit. Now it's become part of the production, more of an art form where it is part, you know, it's become the show or enhancing the show. And, and it's, yeah, it's made it much more exciting over the years. And, to be able to be part of that is exciting. Um, the technology, of course, is, makes it, um, you're able to achieve so much more than what we could do in the past. So it, it, I, I do enjoy it. Very good. So let's move into a little bit more into actually how you prepare for a playback of a concert or a show of some type. Um, let's talk about the importance of timing. Why is perfect playback and great timing so vital to lighting design? How does it really help? Well, I mean, to do, during the show, the execution of a cue can either uh, enhance or distract from, from the performance. If, you, if you're off time and it's just, um, it's distracting to the audience. You wanna be there, you wanna be part of the, uh, the enhancement of the show and not the show and, and, and take away from the show. We definitely don't want to have people going like, what, what the hell is that all about? <laughs> because it's, you know, it can be done. I've seen it happen at times where you're like, what, what are they trying to do there? And it, you're there to enhance basically. Right. And, and I know you, you like to say that you either have it or you don't as far as timing and having good timing in your, in your blood, if you will. Uh, but how do you yourself go through and learn a new song and pick up on the major musical changes, either something you've heard previously or something you're hearing for the first time? How do you well, learn uh, for me, a uh, repetition of listening to the song over and over again, writing down, um, basically breaking it down, writing down the, the, the parts of the song, doing it two or three times with a blank sheet of paper. And so, and then comparing what I've, heard in all three t uh, passes and then working, you know, trying to hear exactly what I think should be ac um, accentuated in the show that will help, you know, the flow of it. A lot of times um, I've worked with people where you don't hear exactly what they're hearing. So you have to, again, go through repetition so you can understand exactly what they're trying to achieve. Yeah, that can be tough when the LD says, hey, I hear this little ching right there and you don't hear it and you're yeah. trying to figure out how to, how to hit that cue. Yeah, it, it, it does happen quite often. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, can you tell me that story about with, with Benny and the barrel in that queue you couldn't hear? Yeah, well, Mr. Kirkham, brilliant operator, brilliant man, brilliant programmer. Uh, we were doing Michael Jackson and there was a backbeat in, I was supposed to, uh, there's some moles on stage. It was supposed to be a big hit, but I could never hear it exactly. So Benny, I just said, you know, Benny would always reach over. And so we ended up moving the button next to Benny. So he could hit that one backbeat every night <laughs> and look perfect that way. You got to work with what you have and you have a great team. You utilize the great team. Right. Definitely. And I like, I like what you said also when you listen to a song that you go give it three passes before yeah. you're all done and you see what you're hearing and you make note of that. That's really a, a smart approach. Well, I mean, it helps if you're a musician, which I am not, but you know, if you have a musical background, it's much easier to see, to go with the flow of the music and the, uh, and hear certain things that I don't always hear, you know. So. And when, when you're breaking down a song into the elements, obviously there's the, the obvious things, the, vo the verse and the chorus, uh, and maybe a breakdown in the middle or, or whatever, or solo. But what, how do you yourself listen to a song and what key things are you listening for? Well, besides, the, besides those, um, there's some key accents and also you have to also watch the stage where you'll see accents that aren't always musically there that it's a it's a dramatic effect or a look that the artist is doing and wants it to be enhanced and yeah so it takes all that into it uh, you take that all in and try to put piece it together and it's that doesn't always happen instantaneously. Uh, it takes a, a few passes uh, for me. I like if I'm doing a major tour. I like basically about a week of, of, of uh, prep time to get it into my head, get it into my blood. I just when I'm doing a, a show like that, I only listen to that music over and over. I don't listen to anything else. So. It's, it becomes part of you. So it becomes almost second nature. You're not reaching to listen to something for something, you know it's there and you have to be on top of that to, to achieve the look. Right, yeah, that's a good point. So I know when I was working with, with John Broderick, he was very precise about how I had to set up the front of house and the angle of my hands compared to the console so I wouldn't get exhausted playing the cues and being worried about the ergonomics so that the timing would be better physically. Do you do anything special for setting up your front of house area to ensure a good performance? I do prefer having it the same every day. Um, that's uh, always, it's a luxury. If you're doing the festival circuit, that you don't always get that. So sometimes you have to adapt, but uh, when you're dealing with uh, major vendors, they usually provide for you to have exactly what you need to be comfortable. I myself, um, I'm, I'm using the mouse, uh, a wireless mouse quite often because I'm not reaching for everything on the console. I prefer just having it right, everything there right in front of me within like a, a one foot area. So everything I can, I'm not reaching to, and, and taking up more time and looking for things. I know where everything is. It does help to have the same setup where the fact that you are aware of exactly what you're looking for and not having to uh, think twice about it. And do you stand or sit? Um, I sit quite often, uh, but uh, there are times that I, I do enjoy standing up and getting into it a little bit more. I, I had a, the, the unfortunate experience. We were, um, we were doing this promotional tour and where we were doing three shows of promotion a day. And it, it started out like the first one was at eight o'clock in the morning in Toronto. And the sound man turns around and looks at me and he goes, I think you were asleep, but you were standing up. I went, 
but I was still hitting buttons, wasn't I? He goes, yeah. He goes, okay. <laughs> That's cool. So you, you touched on a little earlier how you listen to the songs over and over and over, which is a great practice before you're going out on tour. But do you actually rehearse your playback skills before a show? Do you, you know, sit on the back? Uh, yeah. and and yes, I do. I, I And with the with technology, it makes it so much easier that you don't actually have to have the rig. You can have um, visualizers. And there's so many out there that make it so much easier to deal with and the, the way the, the technology has become, it's very accurate also. I mean, it's always better to have the real rig in front of you, but that's also becoming a, a, more of a luxury than, uh, than it has been in the past due to the costs and, and just basically, you know, basically production costs. And the visualizers are so amazing nowadays I do I mean yeah I'll, I'll probably run songs probably five or ten times over and over and trying to get it tweaking it out better um, trying to make it exactly how you think it should look um, so yeah we're, we're very lucky now in, in this time period that we have those tools to work with Totally. You know, I know, I know some songs can be very difficult. I've had some that were really hard to, to learn. Can you share a story about a song that was really hard for you to grasp, but eventually you mastered it and had a great time with it? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, um, for example, with, like, with Black Sabbath, a lot of their songs are like almost three or four songs within one with all the change-ups and everything. And so you sit there and you think you got that part down and it turns out to be it's a nine minute song and it's like okay well uh you have to keep going and going and it, it does work out uh again it's with the repetition and, and breaking it down to the point of where it's become second nature it, it makes it so much easier to and the, utilizing the tools that you have uh, the way to program it. Uh, I prefer doing multiple cue stacks and triggering off a master. So it, it, it works out rather well. Nice. So let, let's talk about the actual art of playback. And you just touched on a little bit of that, about how you set up your desk. And that's what I want to talk about is how do you, do you prefer having a cue list with all go commands or do you like to have lots of buttons and faders where you can make it up? Or do you like a mix of the two? How do you prefer to, to set that up? Well, um, uh, depending on the show, I do prefer a master cue list, but I do have the multiple cue stacks that are being triggered from the master cue list or manually triggered by myself. Um, I utilize a lot of follow cues where you, you time it out perfectly. So as long as you hit the first cue in, in perfect timing, then uh, everything should follow suit correctly. Um, a lot of it depends on uh, the programmer that comes out also. Uh -oh. Why now? Really? <laughs> I, I'm very sorry about that. And it's, it is a spam call, of course. Oh, well, it has to stop soon here. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that real life yep okay are we still there yep still here so you were talking about the on the console the mixing of buttons and the go yeah so um i made it would, to be able to put everything together like that uh, and with the master cue list i yeah i am triggering the sub cues i also am triggering uh, sub cues manually with the hits um, I'm watching the, uh, the artists on stage. So if there's a certain move, I know they're going to do, for example, a drummer. Uh, I know when to, yeah, I'll have that manually. So I'm watching him to make sure that it's all in sync on stage with what's going on on stage. 
Now, I know you also do a lot of busking from time to time where, where the you don't have a cue list defined and you're kind of making it up as the band plays along. How do you prefer to A, approach that and B, set it up on the desk itself, set up your cues for busking? Well, with busking, I, I prefer like having two or three pages with looks, uh, d d uh, a variety of looks. I'll break it down to where I have position cues, I'll have color cues, I'll have effect cues, and then uh, utilizing the features of the board, being able to change the, ex uh, the executor timing. And so trying to flow with that. A lot of times you're hearing music for the first time. So that makes it more difficult, but you just you go with your background and, your, and the feel of it. And if you have, uh, yeah, I mean, basically it's in your blood to, if you, you know how to best if you have to. I mean, it breaks down to, unless it's very unique style of music, it's you know, rock and roll is pretty straight ahead. And so, so how do you lay out those, those buttons for busking? Do you have like uh, by fixture type intensities? Do you have a color stack? What, what's your preferred layout on the desk? Um, well, uh, again, uh, I do make uh, like um, dimmer cues so I'm, I, I can control banks or, or uh, types of fixtures. And then again, with the color cues, so I can take any cue and, and uh, basically alter it live. So I get more of a variety of cues. Um, depending on the console also, uh, for example, with, with a, uh, an MA, I'm, I'm very comfortable on that. So I'm able to use the, utilize the, t the timing aspects of the board and the, um, yeah, I know it's features well enough that I can get away with almost you know, achieving anything I really need to on the fly. I'll, I'll lay it out so to the point that um, uh, effect, you know, beams, ballyhoos, and then I'll have my standard ones uh, of uh, uh, mole fay and, and things like that that are locked in in a, a certain position on the console so I always know where they are. Very good and what about uh, do you use the tools like uh, executor time and adjust things? Oh yeah no I use the executor time um, again if, if you have an idea what the song is going to be like it's easy to change it if you don't know what they're doing if it's the first time you hear it you do it on the fly and do it the best you can. Kind of have to feel the beat and then adjust accordingly, right? Yes, exactly. So when, when you're, whether you're busking or just doing a normal show, uh, what are some clues you get towards the timing of what's happening? Are you watching the drummer for some, for cymbal hits? Are you watching video kind of? What, what's well, you're watching everybody, but, but the drummer is your key factor up there on stage because uh, he either starts or stops or ends the song. With and and it's, he's very visual because of the fact that you know uh, he's uh, de usually dead center and and you watch the main artist but the drummer is is the rhythm of the show so uh, or the, of the song so definitely I'm watching him uh, if you don't have the uh, chance to watch him. Uh, Sometimes, like for example, if you, some bands like having blackouts in between songs, so you, you either either have a click track in your ears to know when the song's going to start, or well, with uh, Ozzy and Sabbath, they do like having lighting on stage, so I'm able to watch, you know, whoever's going to start the song, and then be able to flow right into it. Yeah, that's an important part of timing too, is knowing when they're starting the song. That can be good. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, definitely. For sure. So I know you also, as a lighting director, you're calling spots at the same time that you're trying to hammer things out on the desk and maintain that timing. How do you manage that skill of calling the spots, seeing what they're doing, and staying on beat with the band as you're playing all your cues? Um, to me, this, the art of spot calling 
is, is um, well, a good, a great thing, but it, um, as much as I love the art of spots, sometimes I'm glad that the, the technology is coming along that I don't have to worry about it as much. But um, with, with spot calling over the years, the standby ready and go type cue, you, you, it, you start putting that in your mindset where you almost have to jump that type, uh, th that cue so it's in sync with everything else on stage. Um, with Janet Jackson, we had 18 follow spots out there. And the, you know, we would be calling, I'd be calling the show and I'd break it down to where I would either have, uh, man, I, I broke it down to almost like football where it was either man to man, a man on man or zone coverage. So every, every spot operator had either a zone that they knew they had to go to and cover that. And then or I'd say, go zone coverage, lock in on that man and follow that man until I call you to rezone again. And that way everyone was covered all the time. That makes sense. Now, as, as you're playing back during a show, um, sometimes it can happen, probably not much with you, but you can make a mistake. You can hit something offbeat or do something at the wrong moment. No, not me, no. Not no. you, of course, no. no. Um, but how, how does one recover from that and continue going along and get back on track when you've thrown yourself off and then you're thinking about it in your head and how do you get that going again? Well, A, hopefully you're the main per I, I'm the only person that noticed that I was off, hopefully. If it's really, uh, I, and that's the other thing with follow spots, they can throw you off because if they don't work, if they're not in sync, it, it can throw everything off because then you have to adjust in your head you're trying to correct somebody else while doing everything at the same time to keep your show in sync. So yeah, it, you just you know, learn how to adjust qu quickly. You don't let, you can't um, harp on anything that happens. It's happened. Just continue and keep striving, you know, going forward. Um, if you have the unfortunate experience where you have a, a, an operator that, continually messes up, I'll just tell them to turn the light off and go home, you know, because it's just too distracting and, and just taking away from uh, concentration on the show and the, the overall look of the show. Now, you, you said hopefully nobody notices if you make a mistake, but do you, when you've had a, a bad day or somebody has a bad day, do you go talk to the band and say, sorry about that? Or do they contact you and say, hey, we, we want to talk to you. You've got to go down and well, it, it, that has happened, but um, hopefully they, they're, if you explain the situation, especially if it's a spot operator type situation, they'll understand that, you know, you're dealing with uh, uh, factors that are beyond your control. So it, hopefully they'll understand. Um, I had the info, uh, experience of, I was working with a console at one time where it had an expander on it. And every time I'd hit the go button, the every universe was delayed by a millisecond. So one cue would be going boom, 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 boom. And, and um, the artist was looking at me and going, you're supposed to be hitting it on the beat. I'm going, I am, I am hitting it on the beat. This is just beyond my control. And so it was rather frustrating and uh, I, the developer of the console was sitting next to me and he was going, I have no idea why it's doing that. Great. Great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that doesn't help. And, and that's a good point. Sometimes things are out of your own control. You can hit it perfect, but the technology will get to you. And that's a great segue to where we're, we're going to go next talking about the technology. And uh, a lot of times we have mixed things in the rig between the console and different types of fixtures. You might have fixtures that have, are LED and you might have some that are arc with a manual shutter. Uh, and obviously the reaction time of things are very different than your reaction time. So how do you deal with that? Do you have to press learn to hit the go button early ahead of the beat? How, how do you master all those variants in the technology and how that affects your timing? Now, if, if it's your own rig, you can get your head around the fixtures much easier. If you're cloning, it becomes a, a, a more of an issue. 
especially if you're flying from a, like a discharge to an LED type fixture because of the uh, response time. Um, again, it's just uh, learning how each fixture works and hopefully try to make it the best possible experience. Uh, you can't get it right all the time, unfortunately, especially when, when you're uh, doing a festival or a cloning situation where you're, you're at the mercy of what is given to you that day. And uh, a lot of, I mean, there's so many fixtures out there, they try to emulate what, um, like a, a mole fave with the LEDs, it's, it's not the same, it's just, it's sometimes better, sometimes worse. Yeah, I mean, it's, it depends on the, the look you're shooting for. So it is. It, it does take a while to get your head around it. And the more you utilize these new tools, the more you're, you, know, you, you become aware of what, what you have to deal with and make it work. So do you actually have to sometimes adjust yourself and hit ahead of the beat just because of the... the Molfe, for example? Uh, well, you can adjust a, a little bit, but if you're dealing with a variety of fixtures, you still have to go with what you know because you can't adjust for it. You can't take into account every little detail, especially on the fly. Now, if it's your own rig, yes, because then you can adjust profiles so everything is working in the way you want it to. So... That, that, that makes, uh, again, having your own rig is such a blessing. I experienced that last year when I was going into um, some club shows and every day was like, oh God, <laughs> what, what are these? Oh my God, oh, this, that's where these lights went to die. You know, I, I had no idea, you know, and it, it, it's sometimes difficult, especially if you're doing a show where, for example, your show is CMY and you run into a situation where Oh, guess what? We have color wheels today. It's like, oh, no, no. And you try to adjust, especially if you have cues that are like a three-second crossfade. And all of a sudden, you, you're just watching it going like, oh, great. It's red, green, yellow, and purple. Yay! Thank you. All right. So do you, do you get concerned about the location of the listener being that you're in front of house and you're hearing it one way and the audience members are scattered all over the place? How do you adjust for that? Well, I don't think uh, it's not the same luxury that sound has where they're able to walk around and adjust, you know, for areas of the arenas or the stadiums. Um, I basically have to think about where I am and and that also changes um, sometimes daily. Uh, the ideal situation, for example, uh, we're normally about 100 feet from the stage and you learn and you adjust to that. Now then there's times where you're 200 feet away at a festival or, or, or closer even. So you do adjust. I've done shows where I have had the lighting console on stage. So you have to adjust for that also. So, yeah, you have to take that into account, but it's, it's very difficult to say you're taking it into account for everybody in the audience. Um, you try to uh, make the experience the same for everybody, but you can't always, especially if, with distance. Um, I try to make sure that in the audience, I'm not blinding people with floor lights so they can still see the stage. I make sure my focus is are either above or below the, the, the majority of the audience. Sometimes you can't really do so, but yeah, you, know, you, you try to you know, give the, it's the audience that, but that's why we're there. So you want to give them the best possible experience. Right. You know, I was working with Peter on a show once and the artist requested that the music be in time on stage because she wanted just everything or the lighting to be in time on stage because she wanted it to feel right for her. So we suddenly had to switch and use in-ears, uh, in-ear monitors to hear the music at front of house exactly as it was being heard on stage. Have you had to do that? And what do you think of using in-ears? Um, I've had it um, uh, for both music and for cl click tracks also. But um, 
it it does help, but it also can throw you because you're not hearing. I mean, what you're hearing sometimes is is not quite the same. But and it that's why I, I prefer not having in ears. In I do I prefer having the click track, so I can you know know when the time my time should start over the fact that. Uh, having to hear what the artist is hearing exactly, because that's not always the, um, the same experience that we're having out of the front of the house. Right. Yeah, I know I tried it once for another show that had a lot of heavy bass and it was very distracting because you would hear the hit in your ear and then like half a second later, you'd feel it in your chest. And it was very hard to keep the timing going with those two feelings uh, going on, it was tough. Uh, but I think in-ears can be useful from time to time as well. Like you said, if you're working on a video production or something. Well, that's different, yeah. But in a live situation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so what about time code? What do you think about time code? Have you, have you used shows with time code to keep everything timed perfectly? I think it's, it's a marvelous tool to use. I've seen some amazing shows done. Um, a, a friend of mine here who's in town, Brian Hartley, does TSO, and it's a time, it's a brilliantly done show. Um, it's an art form. I think sometimes some people take it too far. I call it fart cues, where it, it's just to the point that you don't need to have every breath, you know, have a cue sometimes, but. But it, again, it depends on the, uh, the artist. And uh, it does, I mean, you, you're able to achieve things that you could never do manually, just for the fact that, that you, your hands could not cover that much space on a console to, to achieve that. Now, mind you, I've had a friend uh, who was doing uh, Katy Perry, and I thought the show was time code because he wasn't moving his hand at all. Yeah, you know, just he, and I went over. And I said, "That's a brilliant time code show." And he went, "No, it wasn't. It's it's me." And I went, "But you don't move." He goes, "I've done it enough that I just have to hit the go." That's like that. And I was like, "Oh, great." And and when you've done time coded shows, did you yourself hammer in the cues and record as it went along the time code, or did you listen and try to write down times? How did you stamp in those times? Well, with, with, with the technology now, it's so much easier to do because you're able to record button strokes all the way through. And if you don't like it, just clean up, take out those that, that cue stack basically and re redo it again. Um, and you, then you can adjust in the editor to exactly put it exactly where you want it. So yeah, you, you utilize your tools and make, you know, make them work for you. That's why they're there. Yep. So speaking of tools, can you imagine any future technology that would help uh, operators have perfect playback and perfect timing abilities? Or do you think there's new tools in the consoles or new technology that could aid in perfecting the timing? Well, right now for me, the best tool out there for is the new follow me, follow spot type situation, the Robes, the... Uh, all the, the PRG has their, their follow spot, but taking out the human factor that where you're in control of all the follow spot functions is a huge benefit. It also, you're not do, having to call spots because the fact that you're controlling them, they're just following the person. And so that makes it a much easier show to run because you're not dealing with spotlights. And the, and the problems that come along with spotlights, for example, bad bad intercom is one of the worst things that has, happens. If you're, that's a tool that you're relying on, and all of a sudden it's not there, your show goes to crap. So, so yeah, that, I mean, uh, other future products, uh, products. I mean, they just keep coming out. It's amazing what they've done with like drone technology. Um, I mean, I don't know if I'll ever be able to utilize it, but it is fascinating that you know, the the, um, the borders just keep opening up to more and more uh, imagination, 
and it, it makes it fun. It makes it a lot, yeah, very exciting. Definitely. And, and back to talking about the, the automated spot systems, I think that's a big plus, as you said, because all the queuing can be built into the desk and now you're in charge of that timing, not these various people that are kind of random along a tour. They just have to point the light at the right person. Right. If you even have to do that with some systems, that's even automatic. Yeah, no, it, it's been, it, it is amazing. Plus again, not having to call the spots um, and not dealing with, with that, that factor and also the safety issues that there are, are now, you don't have to require people climbing up, up, up 60 feet in the air to, you know, to be locked in and waiting 20 minutes between set changes for everyone to get up in positions. They can go sit at a table and pick up a mouse and achieve the same thing. Right. Yeah, that's definitely a good thing. So we've kind of rounded the corner here uh, on this. There's a few questions that come in. And if anyone has questions, feel free to type it in the Q&A box or even the chat box. And I will ask Michael your questions. I'll start that in a moment. But Michael, before we get to the questions, is there anything else you want to talk about regarding perfect playback? I mean, this has been excellent so far. Um, Basically, uh, just keep rehearsing and then going over and over again, and that it gets into your blood. And hopefully, the band's perfect, and then that helps if the band's perfect too, because if they're off, that can throw you off also. You know, it does happen. Right. Sometimes there'll be times where an extra four bars come into a song and then you can see the band look at each other like, oh, who did that? Like, oh, well, well, just go with the flow, guys. Come on. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We have to be on the same page here somewhat. Yeah. All right. So here's a question that's coming in. Uh, what is your favorite console that you've used? Um, I have to say probably the Grand MA2 just because the... Uh, with the technology and the uh, the features that it has, it it allows you to do so much to the networking. Um, for me, I, I like to utilize the uh, that uh, remote focus where I can just take a tablet up on stage and focus by myself. I'm not dealing with having to have people stand on stage. I, you know, it just makes life a lot easier. And it's a very powerful console. That it is. All right. So this question's a little long, but I'm going to read it all out to you. How do you break down a song that has too many punch and they are always the same, chorus after chorus? Would you go halfway in the punch or all the way and punch all of them? For example, a song from Toto, Hold the Line. There is so much punch that if you punch them, all of them, it will look like too much. So you go by just doing change in verses and chorus, or do you do more? Um, well, the, uh, I would say you just still try to keep it interesting to the audience, even though it is repetitive. So maybe break it up so you have multiple looks, even though it is the same, uh, musically the same. So it doesn't become uh, mundane and then just re you know, over and over again. You, you want to keep it interesting for the audience. That, that's why we're there to keep them happy and you know, have them have the best experience possible. Yeah. Next question is, how long does it take for you to prepare to perfect a playback? Oh, let me just read that correctly. How long does it take you to prepare for a perfect playback of a lighting show? Um, I, for me, I, I like having a, a week of prep beforehand where I can just keep pounding the songs into my head and then using visualizers or, or if we have the, the luck having a production for you know, three to five days where you can actually have your hands on the fixtures so you're getting the real feel of the fixture so you, and the response time. So, yeah, basically about a week for me. I enjoy that for, for a major tour. Yeah, that makes sense. 
Um, what was one of your revolutionary learning moments? Wow. <laughs> well, one of them is don't let your friends take you out to a restaurant and get you really drunk and have you walk through a plate glass window. That, that's, that was a big one. Yeah. That seems like quite a learning moment. <laughs> yeah, it was a learning moment. I learned that you don't do that more than once. <laughs> and I understand that you walked through a plate glass window after drinking too much, yet the next day you ran a perfect show. Well, hey, you got to run with the big dogs. You, you, know, you got to do it. You know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, what do you look for in programming to make playback easier or more efficient? Do you do your own programming? I, I have, I'm lucky I, I do program. I'm not the, in the same caliber of, of some of the masters out there. But I, it take, I can achieve the same look, but what they can do in like three minutes might take me you know, a half hour to achieve. Or, or if, or, and some of them, I, I, I guarantee I probably couldn't achieve some of the things that Benny or Mark Schwinsky pull off. It was like, uh, oh my God. Yeah, you know, there's some so many masters out there on the console. Um, but yeah, I, I'm lucky that I am able to program and adjust uh, for for my my sake and make it look the way I would I would prefer it to look. Cool. Okay. Next question is: If you could go back and run a show again, what show would it be and why? Ooh, um, well, I have to say, is what some of the best times uh, the Paul McCartney tour that Mark Brickman designed. Um, it was a, just a brilliant family experience out there. It was, it was, everybody was on the same page. Everybody wanted to give Paul 120% every time because he always gave 120%. Um, and it was just great music to work with. So here's a good question. Does your dancing skills help with your perfect timing? Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. I don't know who asked that, but uh, yeah, that, that, that boat done sunk a long time ago, I think. Uh, but back in the day where there was alcohol and other substances involved, yeah, the dancing did help too. <laughs> um, if you're working with another designer and you prepare a song with your own cues and he or she gives you a cue list with total other cues, how do you deal with that? Well, you, you do what they ask and then when they leave, you go back to what you're used to. <laughs> and that's for Terry Cook out there. Terry knows that. Yeah. Yeah, he, he's uh, my friend Ethan Weber, uh, he, who does the Stones. We're both in a situation where we've done these bands for you know twenty plus years, and it's it's in your it's in your bone marrow that uh, what is going to happen. And 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 Terry Good just looks like now nah, just do the way you you're going to do it your way because you know. You're going to do it that way as soon as I've gone anyway. So, you know, it's reality. Do you find that the designers are checking up on you on YouTube? Uh, I, I don't care if they do. I have done it. I'm going to give them my best every night, no matter what. And that's what they're going to see every night. Very good. Okay, another question. Do you have any references for a bad show? Any examples that people can look up to see a poorly timed show? Mm. See, I have a problem with that because uh, my buddy, uh, he, he criticizes quite a few shows, but I have to say that it's an, it's an interpretation. So it's hard to say what is truly a bad show. Maybe it's just the way they perceive it. I mean, it's like art. You can't say it's something really, is it really bad art or don't, maybe you just don't understand it. You know, if they're trying, I mean, I've seen shows I prefer not to, I, I can't agree with, but is it bad? I don't know. Yeah. Right. 
Okay, next question we kind of touched on, but I think he wants a little more explanation of how do you break down your playback? Cue list, subs, and effects. No. What's the layout? And do you play back in a linear way on live shows? Uh, basically, uh, I, I break it down with my master cue stack. It's usually the closest button or the executor to me. And then uh, depending on how many sub cue stacks there are, uh, a lot of times I'll even put some of them on, on another page because I don't need to see them. I know what they're going to be doing. For example, like a mole chase or something that that you utilize quite often. I, I know where it is, but I can trigger it virtually. Um, if it's a busking show, it's an entirely different layout just because of the fact that you have to have more at your fingers than the, just a uh, the, uh, recorded cue stacks that you're, you're accustomed to over the uh, pre-programmed show. All right, a couple more questions. What kind of music do you like best if you could choose for running a concert? Oh, well, whoever's paying me. <laughs> I hate, you know, because you know, there's so many, I mean, I've had the luxury of working with so many t uh, different types of music over my career and all of it makes it fun. I mean, uh, there's a couple artists I prefer not to work with again, and they probably prefer not to work with me again, but yeah, uh, it, it, it depends. Uh, I'm, again, I'm very lucky to have a career that I get to do what I love to do. And, uh, and I get to deal with some very talented people. And uh, you can't really ask for much more than that. In life. Definitely. All right, looks so again, one more question here. If there's video on the stage, do you run an intensity master for the screens so you can adjust on the fly if it's too bright? Um, we work with the video directors usually. Um, there are times where I take over video control to, and make it into a, a lighting tool. Um, but yes, yeah, so you do try to adjust so you have the, the uh, perfect balance between video and lighting, definitely. Super, well, it looks like we've come to the end of questions. Uh, I know your email address is on the screen, so if people have further questions, they can reach out to you and ask you directly. And this has been a wonderful, wonderful thing. Sorry about the phone call in the middle. Of this. It's like, That's okay. But it's been a great conversation. I've really enjoyed it, and I think everybody online enjoyed it as well. So thank you very much, Michael. Well, thank you for having me. I, I'm, I'm, again, very happy to be here and very blessed to be amongst the, the people I've been working with. So. Thank you. Welcome. Laura, did you want to wrap up? Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. We really appreciate you presenting today and Brad for the um, co-presentation. I did want to mention that Brad does have another session on Thursday of this week. So if you wanted to go on to uh, pro.harman.com and register for his session, um, we do have a, a lighting webinar tomorrow as well. And then I believe a couple next week. So quite a few things on the calendar. Um, thank you as always for attending. We know that you're busy and we appreciate your support of the learning sessions. So thank you, Michael, and have a great rest thank of your you day. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye now.